The Pantanal wetlands of South America are the largest wetlands in the world. This is followed by Russia and Canada, who have enormous tundra wetlands. But Australia has over 8 million hectares of wetlands, making it fourth on the list of total wetland area. This is followed by Botswana with the massive Okavango. The majority of Australian wetlands are on the coast. Those that are inland in drought periods can become dry dust bowls as exemplified by the air basin. So the inland wetlands have a lot of migration. The far more reliable wetlands are those found on the coast. The problem for wetland birds at the moment, not only in Australia but worldwide, is that the wetlands are disappearing. And as we look at the spoonbills of Australia, we should be conscious of this problem. A characteristic bird of these disappearing wetlands is the spoonbill. Yet despite the disappearance of these swampy areas, the spoonbill seems to be thriving. And in Australia, we have two species. Spoonbills belong to the order Pelicaniforms. Now the Pelicaniforms have birds with radiating toes and others with webbed feet. And the spoonbills belong to those with radiating toes, long toes, so that they can walk over mud. Wetlands of Australia contain the largest biodiversity of bird life. This goes from birds with webbed feet, some with long necks, to the waders who always have their toes in the mud. Some dance over the lily pads, to the birds that surround the wetlands looking for prey, then others that eat on algae like the duck and the swan. The brauger needs the soft earth around the wetlands where it can dig for tubers. And of course, the fish-eating birds like the cormorants, and this would also include the spoonbill. Wetland habitats have many microclimes, from reeds to open water. Some birds are very small and love to hide in the reeds. Others swim openly on the shallows, putting their bills into the mud and digging for worms. And for each niche within a wetland habitat, there is always a bird that utilises that microenvironment. Wetlands are attractive to the birds because of the invertebrates and fish, and this need is amplified during the breeding phase. There are six spoonbills throughout the world, all about the same size. In Australia we have two. This one, with the yellow bill, is quite distinctive, for it is found only in Australia. The yellow bill spoonbill, otherwise known binomially as Platalia flavipes, Platalia is from the Latin word for spoonbill and flavipes is flavus for yellow and pes for feet. So a yellowish leg, but the yellow-billed spoonbill is really known because of its yellow bill. So the defining feature of the spoonbill is the broad end of the bill and the Latin name platalia or spoonbill really is derived from plata, a flat broad surface. A spoonbill having a rest up in a tree. One leg down, one leg up. Let's just look at detail at some of the features of spoonbills. Firstly, the bare area around the face. This is usually yellow like the bill, but may have color. Secondly, the plumes coming off from the lower part of the neck and upper chest. Then sometimes plume tendrils on the rear of the bird. The bill, proximally, has got bars. Now a spoonbill doesn't have any feathers on the laws or indeed around the bill itself over the face. And this bird, as you can see, has grey on that area. So something has happened with age or breeding. And if we were to go into the Far East Asian wetlands, we would find the black-faced spoonbill. But with the yellow bill spoonbill, this grey area around the bare area on the face is related to immaturity. Magnificent neck plumes on this bird. And notice there are some patchy tan coloured areas. These become more pronounced when they are in breeding phase. Here feeding you can see the spoonbill's bill goes down to the bottom of the water. They have a carnivorous diet and that bill is always searching for things that move. Invertebrates and fish are the mainstay of their diet. The yellow-billed spoonbill can be found as a solitary bird or in small groups. Sometimes there are large flocks, more so in the northern 
warmer area wetlands. Though the yellow bills may roost as a group, when it comes to feeding they are far more individuals. This is in contrast to the royal billed spoonbill that we will look at soon. Pelicaniforms like the pelican and the cormorants will often work as a group trying to catch fish. Though this is common with the royal spoonbill, I have never seen it occur with the yellow billed spoonbill. More likely to be seen feeding singularly in pairs or in very loose groups. Tree roosting is common for the yellow billed, and this yellow bill is probably an immature bird. See how it's got a little bit of rufous coloration to the feathers? And it wasn't alone, there were two other birds very similar standing in close proximity. The other two birds weren't too far away. The interesting thing is when these birds open their bill you think, oh an enormous call is going to come out. But I've really never been able to record anything like a proper bird call. There's often a bit of a grunt and a bit of wing flapping, but no specific call that I've been able to record. Later we will hear the call of the Royal Spoonbill. Spoonbills spend an enormous amount of time feeding. They are generally only feeding on very small fish, shrimps, insects, invertebrates and their larval forms. Catching food for a spoonbill usually involves using the tip of that flat part of the bill for it is full of vibrosensory nerve endings. Once caught in the tip of the bill the bird then flicks its head back catching it at the base of the bill before swallowing. Young spoonbills will play with sticks using a tug of war type play game. This is for the preparation for nesting when often they will fight over sticks. In this clip the bird on the left has a yellow bill, a yellow face, pale feathers. This is the yellow billed spoonbill. On the right hand side the bird has a black bill, black face and white feathers. You can see the difference between these two species of spoonbill. The one on the right is the royal spoonbill. Its size is slightly smaller than the yellow billed. The royal and yellow billed spoonbill both eat on the same material, fish and aquatic invertebrates, but they are quite harmonious. Like this shot here with both species feeding together, they seem to be in harmony. And this harmony is quite a contrast to other Australian arboreal birds that are often antagonistic to any territorial claims to their feeding ground. Both spoonbills in Australia have a pendulous sideways action while feeding. Here the duckweed is so thick and the water is so murky you can't see. It just demonstrates how the spoonbill catches its prey purely with the vibrosensory organs at the tip of the bill. The distribution of the royal spoonbill is wider than that of the yellow billed, being found not only in Australia but also Southeast Asia. And a little further north in East Asia there is a very similar bird called the black faced spoonbill, which is strongly migratory, coming down to Taiwan after breeding in North Korea and China. The binomial name of the royal spoonbill is Platalia regia, given because of its kingly appearance with the crest. Now listen to the call. I'm still uncertain whether it's a true bird call or just clearing water out from the nostrils, but I cannot attribute this call to any other birds and I've heard it four or five times. So you have heard it first on the plumes of Oz. A royal spoonbill in flight, this is a typical bird. White wings, a little mark over the eyebrow, black bill, but let's have a look at another bird in flight. Black tips at the primary wing feathers. This marking shows that this bird is an immature royal spoonbill. As it becomes an adult that black tip will disappear. 
Another feature of immaturity is the absence of a yellow mark above the eye. This is a supercilium, a featherless supercilium. The yellow marking is pigment, not feathers, and is only present in a mature adult. It is also absent from the East Asia, black-faced spoonbill. Another facial marking is on the forehead, just where the feathers meet the bare skin. This is a red marking, and I'm uncertain as to the significance of this. A juvenile spoonbill, bobbing its head up and down, hoping to attract the attention of an adult out in the lake catching fish. There are two other siblings close by, who seem quite content baking in the sun. But this one is begging for a feed and trying to attract the attention of the adults. As it gets towards the adult, the head bobbing increases and one of the wings will go out and start to flap. And as it gets even closer to the adult, this flapping wing will touch the back of the adult bird and be a stimulus for the adult to regurgitate food for the youngster. Despite all the wing flapping and head bobbing, the adult is more intent on having a bath. And when you think about it, Swallowing a spoon is a bit like being a sword swallower. I suspect an adult spoonbill can't wait until the juveniles are weaned. So this youngster failed to get a meal. It did all the right things, coming out to the adult and then flapping its wing, touching the adult's back, or back tapping. But what it failed to achieve was bill tapping. If bill tapping occurs, the chances of getting a meal for a juvenile is far more likely. Here there is vigorous back tapping, but only after bill tapping does the adult allow the juvenile to place his bill into the crop. Here a pair of juvenile twin spoonbills beg for food from the adults. One from mum, one from dad. And watch this. Whoops, the fish dropped. The adult picked it up. So there is a visual component to catching food for a spoonbill. But that bill is the main sensory input, not only for catching food, but also for stimulating regurgitation. Here is another example of an adult regurgitating for a youngster. A group of spoonbills moving through the water like this with symmetry suggests that they are working together on a school of fish. But the yellow bill spoonbill doesn't want to participate in this group feeding, and as I said before, he is more of a loner feeder, and he takes off, leaving the jabiru feeding with the royal spoonbills. The crest on a royal spoonbill comes more off the hind crown than the true cap of the bird. Occasionally the birds erect this crest, but more usually it stands up only when the wind blows. Threskionis is the family name for the spoonbills, and the prototype for the family is the ibis, which we often see in association with the spoonbills, and they are closely related. Threskionis means devout, and this comes from the concept of the sacred ibis of Egypt. A significant amount of tan on one bird, the others have crests, and I suspect this is a younger bird. And here, a very small crest, minimal breeding plumes on the chest. The eyebrow is present, so an adult bird, probably a young non-breeding female. When the spoonbills feed, they seem to catch quite a bit of food, but it's all very small. So this is probably the reason they spend more time feeding than many other waders.
Finally in flight, spoonbills have a combination of wing flap and glide like many other pelicaniforms, but they fly with their neck extended, unlike other pelicaniforms like the herons and egrets that retract their neck in flight. On behalf of Plumes of Oz, thank you for watching this video. It has been a pleasure to present such beautiful birds, and I hope you get motivated to support wetland preservation.